So I will introduce uh, Antonin Pujos, who is a member of our foundation board. He's also founder and former founder and director of the uh, French Institute of Direct of the Fr Research Club, the French Institute of Directors. And so I give the word now to Antonin, who will present the workshop. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I don't want. I, I'm not part of the workshop. Um, but I just want to tell you two words to explain why we invited uh, the Blueprint for a Better Business uh, uh, to, to come here and, 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 and work with us uh, uh, this morning. Uh, but before that, I, I need to do something, is to talk about a, a, a small foundation which is called Ecophilos. Ecophilos, um, it, it's a sort of a think tank, um, which is in fact is a sister foundation of the Zamat Summit. And I would call it an elder sister of the, of the, of the Zamat Summit Foundation because it, it was created before. And the purpose of uh, the Ecophilus Foundation is to promote the idea uh, that we need to put the human person back at the heart of the corporate enterprise. And we have uh, two kinds of action. One is a summer university dedicated to young professionals and, and students. In fact, the, the, I think the seventh or the eighth edition will take place next week in Fribourg, in Switzerland, uh, for two days. Um, uh, if you are interested, you have a site on the Ecophilos and you will find all the information. That's for one. And the second action we have is uh, we, have a, uh, we are organizing, mostly in Paris, um, a yearly cycle of reflection on one thing, one thing per year with monthly meetings with people coming to, uh, to, 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 to talk about the, the theme in question with, uh, uh, I would say, uh, an anthropological approach, uh, as, as a, which is close to, to interdisciplinary, but which adds uh, some, some more dimension to this. Uh, the, third, the third kind of action we, we wanted to have, we are going to have, is uh, the creation of an education, uh, uh, executive education program. Uh, for a long time, I thought I was going to be able to announce here today uh, that we were going to launch the first seminar of, of this kind. Uh, unfortunately, we are missing a, a, a very important piece of, of, of the whole thing, which is an agreement, uh, a very important agreement in, in, this, in this whole uh, setup. But we have an agreement with the St. Gallen University, uh, which has accepted to offer us anchorage. So we have our, uh, 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 we are going to be um, hosted by St. Gallen University uh, from an academic standpoint. But the, 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 the seminar will take place in various locations in Europe probably. Uh, but why I'm telling you all of this is, 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 is because this executive education program is going to be, among other things, based on the content of the blueprint for better business, okay? And w how, what I just want to tell you two words on how this was, the, the blueprint for better business was created. There are two stories about this, but this is one I prefer. And, and the, the, that one it says that during the first edition of the Zermatt Summit in 2009, uh, a young Englishman came. He didn't know anyone, didn't know what was going to happen. He came and, you know, it's a long way from London, as all of you know. And so he came and discovered that what, what was uh, happening here. And uh, he went back home and decided that something had to be done. And he did something called the Blueprint for Better Business. And his name is Charles Wookie here, uh, sitting on the left. Now, this being said, uh, I am going to pass the word to, 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 to the BB team. BBB team, Blueprint for Better Business. Thank you. Thank you, Antonin. Okay. <laughs> right, well, thank, thank you for that uh, introduction. Charles has obviously got a lot to live up to, um, but the rest of us don't. Um, we've got a pretty interactive session because um, you've been working uh, very hard and listening a lot uh, this morning. And quite frankly, having listened to that wonderful panel just before coffee, I'm just worrying that we've come up with a solution to a problem that they've already solved through the wonderful work they're doing. But, or maybe it's just a UK problem. We're, that's what we're going to explore today. Um, just the format is, you all were asked to send some questions in, in relation to a case study that was sent out. 
Don't worry if you haven't. We did get some very, very good questions in, but we are going to have a session where you get a chance again to look at the case study and really think through some more questions. So that's going to, to come next. And then we'll have another session afterwards to look deeper in, a, in the case study session to actually how it means and how we can make it work in practice. So that's how the format is going to go. My name is Lachlan Hickey. I work uh, with Charles uh, at the BBB project. I used to be at KPMG for 30 years, leading their tax practice uh, globally for the last six years. So I've been at right at the intersection of challenging societal demands and, and the private sector. So it's a very great learning experience. And since 2012, I've been working with Charles on the blueprint. And my main job is to lead engagement with companies. So now I'm going to ask Charles and Naftali to introduce themselves and give a bit of flavor of what is behind the sessions that are about to follow. Charles. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you, Antonin, uh, for what you said. It's not quite true. It's just down to me. It's, a, it's, a, it's absolutely a group, a group effort, which I'll explain. So my name is Charles Wookie. I uh, work for the Catholic Church in London uh, most of my time uh, for Archbishop Vincent Nichols at the Bishop's Conference of England and Wales. And you may think, well, why on earth am I here and working on a project like this? So here is the story. Um, as well as being inspired by coming here personally, um, in 2009, Pope Benedict, as many of you will know, published an incredible document called Caritas in Veritate and, uh, the, uh, uh, as, a, as a contribution to thinking about the, the Catholic social teaching, obviously, but in the context of secular society and the way the world was going after the financial crisis. I was telephoned by a man called Brian Griffiths, who is the vice chairman of Goldman Sachs in London. And he said, Charles, this is the best thing I've seen on the financial crisis. Everybody in the city is running around. They all know there's a terrible problem and nobody knows what to do about it. This is by far and away the most powerful, moral, thoughtful critique of what's gone wrong and of what the world needs to do about it. And you guys should use it. So I went to uh, my boss and I told him that and he said, fine, uh, so let's see what we can do. What we ended up doing, with the help of Brian and a number of other city leaders, was a private seminar uh, in Schroeder's Bank in the city in October 2009, which was attended by 26 city leaders. It was a private meeting. We had the chairs of six of the largest banks based in London. Interestingly, they all came. It wasn't on the basis of religion. Most of these people weren't Catholic. And it was called Leadership in the Financial Sector, a Moral and Spiritual Challenge. And working with another person who's been closely involved in our work since, uh, called Andrea Ponti, who was then a partner at Goldman Sachs, we put together a short document, which was quotes from the, quotes from the encyclical and some really good insiders questions, really good challenging questions. And we had a three-hour meeting. And at the end of it, they said, that was brilliant, because it wasn't the regulator, it wasn't philanthropy, it wasn't commercial, it was a different kind of conversation really about organisational culture, and they were really challenging each other because it was private. And they said, we haven't had this conversation before, and can we do it again? And they said, we like the idea that the Archbishop has convened this because he's not a market participant. He's got no skin in the game. And also, Archbishop Vincent Nichols, uh, now a cardinal, um, was really, really, he did the opposite of what they expected. He started the meeting by saying, in my view, the financial sector should be a moral leader in our society. You have a job to serve society, and you should be looked up to. He did, he, they were expecting to be told, what on earth are you doing, you greedy people? And he did the opposite. So he appealed to their moral responsibility and affirmed the positive value and importance of the, of the financial sector and the private sector more generally. And because of that, they really, really respected him. And it was, of course, exactly the right way to appeal to people to think seriously about their responsibilities. So we did, a, we did that again six months later, and uh, what that led to was a number of business leaders a year or so later coming to see him, of whom Lachlan Hickey was one, saying, look, the problem of trust between business and society is getting worse, which it is and has been since. It's contaminated way, in, certainly in the UK, way beyond the financial sector. Things like the BP disaster in Mexico didn't help. We had GSK with corruption scandals and so on. But the general perception of trust between business and society has been going down. So at the end of 2011, a group of business leaders came to see the Archbishop and they said, we believe that the problem of trust between business and society is now not something that business leaders can solve by themselves, whoever they are. However much personal integrity they have, if they stand up and say this, nobody believes them. 
It's really, really serious. So why did they come to the Archbishop? I think three reasons. One, because they'd heard of what he'd done and they could see him personally being engaged and concerned by this. Secondly, not because you would go to the Catholic Church as an institution if you were worried about trust. Just at the moment, the Catholic Church is coming out of a real problem of its own. And I've, in my other side of my job, I've been very involved in trying to help deal with the aftermath of the child abuse scandals in the church. So the church as an institution is not, you know, it's, it's uh, got its own issues. So it wasn't for that. So they came because of him personally and mainly because in, the, in Catholic social thinking, the feeling was, and in Aristotelian virtue ethics, that here was a resource that stood for the best values in society that actually could really help develop a language of reconnecting business and society. So the Archbishop seconded me to work with Lachlan and these others, and we formed a group called The Purpose, uh, a Blueprint for Better Business. And very quickly, two issues came to the fore. One was the question of purpose. And one of the things I remember, Antonin, uh, from the 2009, the first Zermatt summit, was a lecture by Philippe de Wood, in which he talked in English, but with a heavy French accent. And he said, the question is, if you, if you don't mind my, because it's, it's better in the French accent, you might, if I won't be rude and say that. He said, the question is, what is the finalité? The finalité is what you say in French. He said, I look up the word finalité in the English dictionary, and I found raison d'être. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, and that's a really interesting point, because the word purpose in English doesn't carry the same immediate... It has one meaning, obviously, of that, of telos, but it's not, not the only meaning of the word purpose. So anyway, so purpose is key. The other thing was, in the research we did, um, people reporting living a divided life. And this comes out very strongly in an excellent document, which you, some of you may have seen, produced on the vocation of the business leader by the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace in Rome, where they mention this as well. And this is a key thing. So uh, to be very brief, because I think I've gone over my five minutes already, but the, the essence of the framework that we thought about was if businesses are really clear about their purpose, so if I go back and say Stephen Green at the first seminar, who was then the chairman of HSBC, I remember him saying this, it was private, he said it. So the problem is everybody thinks there are two questions you need to ask. Is it legal and is it profitable? And if it is, you just do what you like. He said that's what everybody's been doing. If everybody does that, you lose respect for customers, you lose your market share, and in the end you completely undermine the basis of trust in the market on which all profitable activity depends. So we have to get away from that. So what's the third thing? And the answer is, and of course the best businesses have always known this and have always done it, they have a story about why they're there. So purpose for us became absolutely key. And Lachlan, with his insight from his own experience, was really strong on leading on this from the beginning. And then you think about the divided life. So people need to bring their whole selves to work. We don't want to live in compartments. So our kind of little model really was very simple. You say, if be really clear about purpose, you know why you're there, then two things follow. One is the competencies of the people you need in the business, and the second is the character. What kinds of people that business needs to form over time if that business is to stay true to that purpose. So we then developed a one-page framework, which we'll come to later and we'll go through uh, with you in the, in the second part of the workshop, which, which uh, did that. And we launched it at a conference in September 2012, one side of A4, distilling Catholic social teaching with Lachlan and some other, uh, others working on it. And we had 200 business leaders, three global CEOs speaking, Dominic Barton from McKinsey's Worldwide, Paul Polman from Unilever, and Vittorio Colau from Vodafone. Uh, and at the end of that conference, in September 2012, as I showed him out the door, Paul Polman said to me, he said, Charles, that piece of paper is very, very good. And I'm willing to use Unilever as a test bed to see whether we can turn this into something that would really be... Uh, uh, practical and actionable in a business like ours. So I'll stop there, but that's how we got going. Thank you, Charles. And Naftali... <laughs> I think we should close now while we're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Naftali, you've got a, a sort of personal view on, the, on this whole journey. Okay, of so um, I come to this um, in a roundabout way as, as an ordained Orthodox rabbi. Um, and I was a congregational rabbi for some 20 years. And in that context, I think the essence of what I spent my time doing um, was helping my congregants uh, answer the question, what is a meaningful life? What is a purposeful life? Didn't have all the answers, but I became very adept at helping them ask the right questions to be able to discover those answers. And then about three years ago, I made quite a radical shift for a rabbi, which is I left the rabbinate um, and I sought a broader platform and became the head of Spiritual Capital Foundation, which in essence tries to ask the same question of organizations. What is a purposeful or meaningful organization? 
and sort of the skills and experiences that I brought from my personal encounters with my congregants, I now bring to a wider context with, with organizations. Um, and I'm happy to talk to any of you over the course of the next two days about the particular methodology um, that, that I use. But it's in that context that I was introduced to Charles and Lachlan and the Blueprint for Better Business. And I immediately realized that there was a real synergy here because they were creating um, uh, a solution to the problem of purpose. And so I got stuck in on a number of, of, of levels. One was working with the religion track. So it is a, based on Catholic social teaching, but there's a strong interfaith element, and I've, I've been very involved in that. Uh, secondly, just been promoting it as much as I, I possibly can a couple of weeks ago as far as Melbourne, Australia. Um, and when we have conferences like this and other fora to try to frame what purpose is. So if I can just spend the remaining uh, five minutes, I think, or a little less, trying to do that for you. And in uh, good rabbinic fashion, I have to quote a text. Um, but it's not a rabbinic text. It's not even a religious text. It's actually uh, Melville. It's, it's Moby Dick. And if any of you want to look this up afterwards, it's chapter 52. Now, this is Ishmael, who you might recall is this young deckhand who's gone on this crazy voyage around the world with this mad Captain Ahab in search of this elusive uh, whale. Round the world, there's much in that sound to inspire proud feelings. But where to does all that circumnavigation conduct? Only through numberless perils to the very point whence we started, where those that we left behind secure were all the time before us. Where, were this world an endless plain, and by sailing eastward, we could forever reach new dis distances and discover sights more sweet and strange than any Cyclades or islands of King Solomon, then there were promise in the voyage. But in pursuit of those far mysteries we dream of, or in tormented chase of the demon phantom that sometime or other swims before all human hearts, while chasing over this round globe, they either lead us on in barren mazes or midway leave us whelmed. And that text really speaks to me because it, it essentially captures the difference between a purposeful voyage and a purposeless voyage. The difference really is between a linear voyage and a circular voyage. And much of what we experience as individuals in our lives, and I speak of this as an individual, and I'm sure you've experienced this as well, is that often our lives are circular, like Ishmael, going around and around and around, and the things we thought we left behind years ago are still in front of us. And we, we're like on a treadmill. So we work to pay bills, we eat, we sleep, we work, we pay bills, we eat, we sleep, and we're going around in circles. And at some point, those who are more reflective or sensitive begin to ask, where does this lead? Perhaps not in quite the same beautiful terminology of, of Melville, but we all ask this question. Um, so the solution to converting a circular, closed, self-indulgent, meaningless journey into a linear one is by learning to ask one particular type of question, and that is the higher order question. So the lower order questions of how, when, where, these are the questions that drive our daily performance. But the higher order question is why, and why is a question that is rarely asked. I don't think that boards of organizations that are in the midst of uh, you know, their daily business stop and pose the existential question of why. But that question of why is the key to turning a, a circular business into a purpose-driven business. And circular business is the same thing as individual uh, circular journey. Um, I, ask, I often ask CEOs, what is the most important element to your organization? They'll say people. And I say, why are people important? Because people help us make a product or, or a service. And that's important because that helps us make a profit. And then I say, why do you need to make the profit? And they say, because we can hire more people or better people to make better, more expanded services and make more profit. But then why do you need to make that profit? And that's the closed circle. So what, what BBB tries to do, the Blueprint for Better Business tries to do, is it tries to convert that, that closed circular journey, which incidentally, in our personal lives, anyone with common sense realizes that it leads nowhere. But, but paradoxically, in business, 
where it can have the greatest good or the, or the, or the greatest impact for damage, a circular journey has almost been enshrined by Milton Friedman, no less than others, who say, actually, that is the essence of business. To ask why of business is to undermine business. And, and it is that fallacy that, that, that Blueprint for Better Business is, is trying to, to unravel and trying to create a linear journey of, of purpose. Right. That... <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Naftali. And what we want you to do now, and on your tables, you don't need to select special teams, is to revisit the case study that was sent out before the conference. Fortunately, you've got another copy on your tables. We got um, a whole load of questions coming back, um, but what we want the chance for people to do is to discuss the case study together to enrich it. And actually to do two things, if you would. One is on the table, think about, as a table, what would be the two most important questions you would like to ask if you were the chairman waiting for the BBB representatives to turn up. And the other thing I'd like you to consider as you're considering the case study is what do you think of the chairman's stated purpose in terms of how it could drive better performance in that business? And finally, if you can select someone uh, to feedback, we are not going to go around each table. So if we ignore you, we're not ignoring you as a human interest level. It's just the interest of time. So we'll ask a couple of tables, but if you can nominate someone, the top two questions, but discuss the case study together. And I'll give you about 15 minutes uh, to do that in group. Thank you. Okay. I understand you all love working together, but there's a lot of more of it going on during the rest of the week. So if you can make friends with all the people you've fallen out in the discussion. <laughs> and I'm just going to ask a couple of tables to, to feed back. Um, and what we're asking them to do is to feed back, were there another couple of questions that they'd want to ask to say, oh, we've already got a lot of good quality pre-questions. And the other one is just to consider whether the uh, purpose is stated in the case study they believe would drive better performance. Well, I think I'm going to start, in, I'm going to go for the corners just in case they felt that they'd be ignored during this. So this, this corner over here, would you like to report back? Or should we panic? <laughs> well, you know, it's easy to ask the first question because we would say um, to BBB, uh, how can you help me? I feel the we have value on one side, many thing, we do many things, but how can you help me find, finding out what are my values, what is my, the real purpose to, to, have, uh, to, to, to make sure everybody, to help me uh, convincing uh, suppliers, employees, all the, the stakeholders to, 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 to work with us okay. and, uh, and go uh, and build so start a start with a nice simple way. question, thank you. <laughs> and do you want another one? Or that's, that's, well, that one will do because it's pretty all-powerful. And did you, what did you think about the purpose that the chairman came up with? Do you think that would drive better performance? But there's no real purpose. You see, on, my side, on one side, I have some values, but I'm too, I don't want to communicate them because personal life. Uh, on another side, there's many little things I can do, and most of them uh, are not centered on the human being, but on what money could do to make the world better or to make, me make my communication be uh, better. But it, there's no consistency. Okay. A lot of uh, and no, no purpose, no unity. Okay, so there's no consistency, no unity, even though he has actually put out a stated purpose which was to dominate the industry. I think that the challenge is um, would, who would that actually motivate? So I'm going to come to this corner, if I may, um, and ask them the same question. You can give the same answer if you like, or you can give something totally new to add to the mix. Um, so we had, in terms of the questions, um, I think the one that really resonated uh, with us from, from the table was um, for him to ask them, where is the disconnect between what I see we're doing around values and where our, our employees um, are seeing? So why am I having the impact that, uh, that I think we should be having um, and, and where's the disconnect between that and, and our employees? Um, and, uh, and then a, a second one was then, how do I make our values real? So how do I engage our employees with them and, and have them feel that in a real way? Um, so it's not just about an external CSOR where you're giving money to people, but actually making it real inside the organization. Great. Okay. And did this view 
this company or this table have a view on purpose? <laughs> Did you realize it's you had It's a view not on kind to you because we had no time to discuss the, the pure post question. <laughs> My personal feeling is to really drive the company out. <laughs> but we did not have time to discuss the Okay, purpose. so he's going to get some personal consulting advice afterwards. That's good. <laughs> we like that. We like that personal touch. Okay. Well, I'm going to actually bring those into the discussion because they're actually really um, getting to the heart of also some of the pre-questions that we had. And it was very interesting when we looked at the pre-questions. They actually were a mix of what should a company do from a, with a corporate mindset and what was going on with inside individuals. It's almost sort of mirrors what Naftali and Charles were saying. The other thing is the case study was based on some of the real situations we come across. It wasn't just invented in the closed room. It actually reflects some of the tensions that are going on out there with companies, particularly those who are in the kind of difficult position. They think they want to change, but they can't work out whether they need to or how to. And I think that comes a lot in your, in your questions. So what we're going to do is to um, ask uh, the people who have actually been working with the companies, including myself, and go through the serious questions we had, not one by one, but the themes resonate with what we're asked time and time again when we start to talk about BBB. And probably the first one, I'm going to give this to you, Charles, is yeah, I've, I've heard about BBB, but actually, what is it? Good question. <laughs> so the first thing to say about the blueprint is uh, it's now an independent entity. It started, as I explained uh, in, in the kind of story I told you all, uh, as an initiative from within the Catholic Church in England and Wales. It's now an independent charity called the Blueprint Trust. We have four trustees. Lachlan is one. Andrea Ponti, who I mentioned earlier, is another. Sue Garrard from Unilever as a third, and Barbara Stocking, uh, who used to run Oxfam worldwide, and she's now in Cambridge University as the fourth. So we have two, four trustees, two Catholics, two not, two men, two women, two people who've been involved from the beginning, two who became involved just, just quite recently. So it sits there independently. Um, uh, they've they've uh, rather foolishly appointed me as the interim uh, acting CEO, and I've been released by the uh, Cardinal to work for the next year with them. Uh, and we'll see what happens after that. But half my time I'm spending that. We've um, funded it from charitable foundations. Uh, and the idea is that it should be independent of business, it should be independent of the church, it should be independent of the regulator, and it should sit there as a catalyst. And it's a kind of movement. We do not want, we know what we do not want. We, do know, we, we know the risks of capture by, of all those agents, and we want to avoid capture. We want it to avoid it becoming a kite mark, a PR exercise, and something that can be passed down the corridor by CEOs and chairs. The idea is that it should be something that galvanizes change and enables people to own for themselves. It's not about having answers that you can say, here are some tools that you can use. There's a great quote, which I thought was from Gandhi, but Lachlan tells me it's, I think, T.S. Eliot, where he says, one of the besetting sins of humanity is to dream of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. And the idea that we can have a tool which you can just pass down the corridor and everything will be fine. This is, this is something which is, fits so well with the ideology of our age in terms of how processes work and the mechanistic view of just get that thing right and it will be well. This is about a personal challenge. Let's bring the humanity into business and absolutely at the top. In order to, in order, in order to make it effective, we have various strands of work. So we, are, we have got a, 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 an interfaith strand, which uh, Naftali has been a key member of, uh, thinking about the provenance, where this comes from, and its compatibility with the main faith traditions in the world. Also, not just faith, but also neuroscience, behavioral economics, where there's a lot of very interesting research that's been done, which comes to the same views, actually, about anthropology, of how human beings are kind of hardwired, as you get from the main faiths in terms of this, and we can perhaps come back to that later. But there's a distinct anthropology underlying this, um, which you can get from different derivations. We have a, a, a group working with investors, we have a group working with NGOs, where we've, we've got a, a dialogue going uh, there, and uh, uh, also a group with young leaders as well, uh, where, where there's a really, really interesting level of interest with young professionals seeing this kind of approach as being something that's very exciting in terms of their own personal journeys and the companies in which they're working. 
Um, so we're, and, and the other thing we're doing is we've got a, a group working with SMEs in London, which, interestingly, we are doing, in fact, through the Catholic Diocese of Westminster as a, as a forum through which to bring together very small businesses. And the parish priest who's been running that has got very excited because he's now decided that he's a small business, which, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which he never thought of before. So that's a kind of a range of, of, of what we're doing. And that's, and that's, but it's, it's a movement um, which we see as hoping to galvanise change, which is free to air and that people can use and take and make their own. And, and Charles, I can see in this room, um, just listening this morning, the people here, that what you're, you're saying might land quite nicely. But in the big, bad, bold world of global businesses, is, is there much interest? Yes. I mean, we, we've, I mentioned three global leaders who came to our first conference. Um, and since then, we have had a conversations. I suppose we've got serious conversations going now with about 12 UK-based multinationals who are very seriously interested in this. And the reason I think they're interested mainly is because it's not PR. They are obviously worried about trust. Of course, they're worried about trust. But the main thing, interestingly, that they that they see this helping them with, is employee engagement. It's the internal story and internal consistency. Going back to the point that was made earlier about consistency being fundamental, that people see this as a way in which they can help tell a story internally. And the second thing I think people see that this can be useful for, is that if enough people start talking the same story in terms of using similar kinds of language, then you really do begin to get some movement in the way business is perceived and expectations are, are, are set out publicly. Uh, so I think that, the, that, that there is, I mean, uh, we are at an early stage with this, but, but the, the conversations which are with chairs and CEOs, and that's the big advantage of, of having an initiative which from the very beginning has attracted some very high-level individuals who've been willing to uh, um, introduce people to others. So, I mean... Uh, Lachlan and I over the last two months have met the chairs of six of the FTSE 100 companies and had very serious conversations with them and they take this very seriously. Uh, so there's a business credibility about it, which is great, uh, and at the same time uh, obviously an understandable caution on their part about where exactly this goes. But the, they like the idea that it's seen to come from society. I think that's the point that's different about this. There are a lot of very, very good initiatives out there, and this is trying not to duplicate any of them. But the idea that it's about fundamental purpose and comes, as it were, as a proxy from society about saying, if business and society are interrelated, can we have a story that is compelling about, which tells how businesses get their licence to operate and, uh, and see how business is seen as a part of society. So, yes, there is really serious business interest, and from investors as well. Right, and the, and the concern with businesses, they could actually be going down the route, well, I, clearly I'm interested because it's going to help the bottom line. And Naftali, from your point of view, are, are individuals really struggling with this or are they just content with the status quo that, quite frankly, gives them employment opportunity and, and reward? So in my experience, um, very young people who have entered the workforce uh, are very enthusiastic, um, they're very idealistic, and um, nothing's happened at that early stage in their career to temper their, their idealism. And at the other side of the spectrum are CEOs who are beginning to reflect on legacy issues uh, because that's really the point where you ask the question, all right, I've been doing this my whole life, what am I leaving? So I think leaders at, at, at the peak of their career, looking back, and young um, employees at the beginning of their career, the middle is a, is a bit more difficult, and that's because they're cynical and they're cynical because they've seen a lot of half-hearted efforts. We'll probably talk more about this as the, as the session goes on. Uh, and that, that's a very difficult, difficult thing to overcome. Uh, but I think the, the, the solution is to just work with those two groups, and you create a pincer movement that creates facts on the ground. And it's very difficult then to maintain a cynicism when you see things moving forward in a positive way. Okay, so there, so there, is, there is some hope out there that the, the connection of people wanting a personal dividend from this and a corporate wanting a broader dividend actually can help each other. Now, one, one of the questions I think that came up from one of the tables as well, but it comes up all the time, and it came up in the pre-questions as well. It's all very well, but what do I have to do? What are, what are BBB going to do with me, and how much do I have to spend with them to get this new Nirvana you've talked about? Um, and the answer is, is kind of simple but complex. What we say is the first thing you need to do is to uncover within the organization where there is a true desire to make this type of difference. And that is not just having general chats. That is really going to the top of the company, the CEO or the chairman, and say, are they really wrestling with this for the right reasons? And that's why Charles and I go to see CEOs and chairs, because if they just want it to be the new lever 
to pull for profit, then it's not sincere. If they're not struggling internally with some of the questions this table we're talking about, is why is it that I'm kind of thinking we're doing the right things but no one else does? So unless there's that personal dilemma and desire, this is a waste of time. So the first thing we do is talk to CEOs and chairs to see whether they are wrestling with it. Uh, in most cases, the data coming to them, either from customers, from uh, regulators, from their own uh, suppliers, from their own people, is something is going on that they're not happy with. They hope it will go away, but they realize it won't. And the other thing they're now saying is, actually, there is this awakening. I want to leave a good legacy. So what do we actually do with them? We actually allow them to explore it. So the, the tools which we'll talk about later give you a frame of reference to challenge yourself. When I talk about purpose, do I mean it in the right way? And the second is the credibility gap between what I'd like to be and what I am. Because there will be a gap. And the question is, do they want to bridge the gap and how would they do it? Now, in terms of cost, Charles talked about independence. BBB is set up to be independent of business, which is why it doesn't take membership fees. It also doesn't take consulting fees. We, we will consult with companies to help them energize their own people to come to the solutions. But what we're also doing, some, one of our colleagues, Norman, is leading, is to actually enable consultancies who implement to understand BBB better. So if companies need an external resource, they have somewhere to go. So in terms of cost, what companies should see it as, it's, it's no more costly than any other improvement program that they would put into their organization in the way they would normally do it, but asking themselves different questions. So what we do is really help them wake up to, do they want to do it? Is the journey credible? And actually, can they galvanize enough people internally to want to do it? And we can help them at all stages of that conversation. And what they'd like is, we are doing it to protect the integrity of the methodology and the provenance so that they can draw value from it, rather than us creating value and actually drawing value from it for ourselves. So they'd like that consistency of what we're saying and what we say that they can do. The other part of that we just, I'll just touch on, which comes up a huge amount of times, and it comes up with some of the pre-questions. Is there a trade-off between profitability and social responsibility? And we say time and time again, actually, there's not. It depends on what time scale. There is a timing issue. And this is where we get into really practical things with companies. Is when companies look at this, what we say to be authentic to purpose is look at your growth, profitability, goods and services, and investments, and see how aligned they are to your purpose. That will tell you a couple of things. One is whether you've got a purpose that you can actually use. Is your purpose fit for purpose? And the other one, what is the gap, what you need to do? And what, they will, what we ask them to do is to put it into three buckets. One is the, uh, the profit and growth and actions that derive directly from purpose. One that are quite neutral, they just happen to exist and that they work okay. And those that clearly are totally independent or contrary to purpose. Those are the ones you need to focus on. And what we've seen with companies taking this practically is they say, okay, we understand that, but we've still got to run a business. So what they set their mind to is the time scale as they take out or redesign their product, their service, their offering, what do they replace it with? One insurance company we're working with has taken out a higher margin product to bring in a product they think is much truer to purpose. It just means they have to sell more. And that's what they clearly built into the plan. We've got another one in the retail sector, particularly focused on sustainable products. They're taking products off the shelves and replacing them with better ones, but they can't take them off and leave empty shelves. So they're looking at that. We've got another retailer who is looking at the combination between um, the real world, the competitive landscape they're operating, the price points that customers demand, the quality, the assurance, and trying to change the design of their products. What materials can they use? And what it forces, we call this the liberation of boundaries. If purpose is bounded, it forces you to innovate. And one of the things we have seen throughout this, if you're forced by boundaries to achieve the same aim, it forces you to innovate for good reason. And that's what we're seeing these good companies do in practice, is they've got something they can move. And the other thing they like about um, BBB and the frameworks is the fact that it's actually an entire system. It's not just one thing to solve one problem. 
It's a way to look at your whole business and just take your time about how you would actually um, move it on. So that's basically, uh, basically what happens. <coughs> the next question that, that comes up, and I'm going to ask Charles this, is, okay, I'm now on the journey. I believe that I'm going to do something. But just as I explain this to people, actually, how do we benefit as an organization? And actually, how does society benefit? Because that's what you're saying should come out of this creating common goods, which is a common good in which we share, but society certainly should. So how does, how does that happen? <coughs> the, the answer to that, as, as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 and as Lachlan just said again then too, a lot of the interest from businesses has been about relationships internally, uh, and there's a clear benefit to that. If, uh, 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 an image that Lachlan's used sometimes when we had conversations with business is you go into a room and you say, okay, well, on that wall, we've got our company mission and vision statement. It's there. We think it's great. What's the point about having the blueprint principles as well? Well, the blueprint principles as well are language that we've signed up to as a business, but they're not our language. This is external language. This is language from society which stands for certain things that we think we do by reference to our values over here. But you know what? Maybe we get captured. Maybe we use our internal language, and maybe we're not doing what we say we're doing. So by saying that we're also going to use these other things over here, these other principles, which we think are consistent, you can judge us. Judge us by the higher standard. Judge us by both. So bring that external conversation into the room, into the business conversation. And in that way, you, you get over the divided life. So it's kind of internal permission to use ordinary language and ordinary values to challenge business ch decisions. So the energizing effect within companies, I think, is one of the things that businesses see. Um, and also, you'll see when you look at the, 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 the principles that we're going to discuss in a few minutes, the relationships that businesses wish to have and are happy to be judged by and want to be judged by in terms of their accountability to their key, the key relationships you have, not only in terms of being a good citizen with uh, the, the relationship with the community, but with your customers and suppliers, and also your responsibilities to the environment and to the future. So there's a, there's, I think what, what people like about it is that they see employee engagement, they see that there's, an in, there's, there's a coherence to this which enables and facilitates internal discussion about very difficult issues and a language around that. But I think the other thing, which I would say, and it's come up again very recently, one of the big issues, certainly in the UK, which really does undermine trust, is pay. Okay, that's the, big, the biggest single thing. Pay and tax are the two things that really, certainly for big businesses in terms of their reputation. So what do you do about pay? Even if you're a very, very big company, it's extremely hard to do anything about pay short term. But we all know that the way that the world has gone the last 30 years, the, the ratios are crazy. And they cannot and should not be sustained over time. But how do, you, how do you change it? Nobody wants to be a tall poppy. Nobody can be a tall poppy. But if people work together and start telling a different story publicly about what the responsibilities of businesses are and how they think they can move this, then over time, change is possible. Nothing is immutable here. There's nothing which, in, in laws of nature which says, says that these ratios have to be as they are now. They can change and they must change because the inequality is ridiculous. And, and a lot of businesses do know this, but they can't do it by themselves. Now, one advantage of something like this is that it can help the collective conversation change. It can help, very slightly, help change the culture, alongside lots of other initiatives that are trying to do the same thing. And that is, a, is things that, one, one factor that a lot of businesses really see the power of this being. And what's in it for society? What's in it for society is the other side of the bridge, because uh, it, businesses are not apart from society. As somebody said we've been working with, they are a part of society. And I think for, for society, what you get from, from this is both businesses that are delivering social purpose. There's a phrase in the document which is in our paper, in, in our framework, which comes from, it's a direct quote actually from the, from the vocation of the business leader document that the Vatican produced, where it talks about producing goods that are truly good and services that truly serve, which is a wonderful phrase about how the best businesses should be run. Uh, and what they're designed to do. And if businesses do produce goods that are truly good and services that truly serve, then society benefits directly as a result of those businesses doing that. At the moment, a lot of businesses seek to justify themselves in terms of social benefit through corporate social responsibility. Often the social responsibility programs are very, very good, and uh, I'm not saying that they're not, but it is also a way of displacing the, and, and uh, as it were, sidelining the core activities of the business. So our approach is to say, the social justification of business is not corporate social responsibility. It's whether the core business activity itself delivers a social value. And that is where the business gets its license to operate. And the, and the social justification of the business should be because they do that really, really well. So it incent, it's completely and totally integrating the idea of responsibility at the heart of the business. 
And if businesses do that, then there's a direct and clear benefit to society. There are huge issues around the edges of this, I realise, which we can get into later. And I'm going to go to Natar in just a second because there's a people dimension from this. Because what some businesses have also said to us that they see the benefit that goes back to society. If you think about um, virtues are, are practice, they're not given. Um, and you worry about the divided life. Business is an experiential school of learning. If it can be an experiential school of learning for good to practice those virtues, they actually transmit back to society as well as benefiting the, uh, the company itself. So they do see that broader benefit that they are actually schools of learning and they can be learning for good or learning for division. Charles mentioned CSR, Naftali, and um, people have mentioned values. Uh, one of the big themes we get when we talk to people is, well, surely we're doing all this. Shouldn't we just up the acceptance of our values and our CSR? And how do you see that playing out with, with the work you do? So I think there, there are two things. One is CSR and one is values versus rules. So I think if I can be blunt, um, and I hope I'm not offending anybody, but if I am, it's too late, um, <laughs> it is what it is. I think CSR is passe. I really do. And maybe that's not surprising to any of you. Um, to qualify that, what I mean is CSR, the way it is manifest in the majority of companies today, um, the past decade is passe. It's, as Charles said, it's, it's grafted synthetically onto the business. So the business does what the business does, however it treats its employees, however it deals with its competitors, its supply chain. And then it builds a school in a deprived neighborhood. That's that, you know, lipstick on the gorilla. It doesn't change, it doesn't change the, the function of the business. So if that's what CSR is, it's not only passe, I think it's, it's very uh, corrosive, and it's better not to have CSR, any CSR, than to have that because that's what embeds cynicism. That's what makes people cynical. They don't see anything changing. They just see window dressing, a, a glorified form of, of branding. Um, but purpose is very different. If CSR is synthetic, purpose is organic. Purpose is taking the company apart and asking the existential question of why and then putting it back together again. And then the company lives and breathes and functions on a whole different level. That's completely different to CSR. Um, is it important to term it? We can call it purpose, we can call it other things, but I don't think labels are so important. It's, it's the difference between something that's synthetic or organic. Um, and sustainability is important as well because the organic will sustain itself in the long run, the synthetic won't. But then you mentioned values, um, and values are important if they're lived. And what often happens is organizations and individuals confuse values with rules. And they're not the same thing. So you can have a set of rules that, that, that dictate particular behaviors in particular circumstances. But that list is going to be limited by the very definition that you haven't experienced all circumstances. And then when you experience a circumstance that isn't on the list, how do you behave? Well, one of our earlier panelists this morning was talking along those lines about testing. Um, testing your experiences against a set of values. So I think what, what the, the Blueprint for a Better Business framework can do is help organizations um, discover and articulate a sense of deep values that are then the, the funnel through which every decision is passed. And that's very different to having just rules, loose rules. And I think very often that, that distinction isn't clear enough. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to ask Charles one last question uh, before we go into the case study because um, one thing that keeps coming up is even if the company believes this, are they allowed to believe it? What about the investors? What do they think of this? Th th there's something else which I want to deal with after the next um, case study which we've discussed a lot with Naftali, some of the risks of doing some of this. But I'd like to start, finish with Charles from an investor point of view. Are they a blockage, an enabler and what's happening? Well, it's a, a key uh, part of this conversation, not in the UK, but, but I think everywhere. Um, the way the capital markets work, the incentive effects of those, and, and the whole short-termism debate. Um, and it's quite clear that um, fundamental to a project like this, having serious traction over time, is a change of approach in the investment community. Now, at our conference last year um, in London, last October, we had a panel of uh, four investors, um, Aberdeen uh, Hermes, who are a British Telecom Pension Fund, 
and also Black Rock, who, as you may know, are enormous. And John Kay, who had done a report in London on, on the way the, the equity markets uh, have been working, was part of that panel as well. And what was very interesting about that was that they recognised that this is the other half of the equation here. And they have been working since with a group who are going to report at our next conference uh, in October. Uh, those uh, three um, fund managing uh, fund funds are, are, are fund managers are, are looking at the framework that we developed and the principles. Um, and uh, they see that there is something here, um, uh, at least to the extent of wanting to apply metrics around it. And the proposition that they're certainly interested in testing is the extent to which, over time, patient capital can and should be attracted to purpose-driven businesses that are really clear about their purpose and find ways of demonstrating publicly that they are uh, seeking to be stayed true to it. Um, I mean, as Lachlan said earlier, the, the, the fundamental assumption here, um, which of course is, is an assumption, and it's in, I'd be, really, be very interesting to hear your comments and views on this and your own experience, is that there is no fundamental trade-off between being purpose-driven and being long-term profitable. Um, there is an, if, you run your if you run your business as a purpose-driven business and you're clear about why, over time you can, you can deliver fair returns to your investors by doing that. Um, so, uh, and certainly in, in, in the work that's already been done by investors around uh, good governance, it's quite clear that there is a direct correlation between quality of governance and quality of returns over time. So um, the investors are very interested in this and they are absolutely key to um, uh, this having traction and growing. But uh, what's also uh, interesting is that a number of companies are saying that they are going to direct uh, who, who want to do this, uh, a lot of the large companies, are very, very frustrated by the way in which the short-term behaviour of, of fund managers works and are actively seeking out patient capital uh, and longer-term investors. And the private equity business, of course, has different, is in some ways better than the public stock market in this respect because you get, at least you get longer relationships built up between investors and the large companies. So the investor side of this, we're actively engaged in discussions, and it's a very, very important and, uh, and critical dimension to this having uh, uh, traction over time. Okay. Was that, was that a hand up? Yeah, it was. <laughs> because, because it could also say that there would be a risk in not doing it. I mean, yes. you, could, that you can build the more traditional investor or a more traditional perspective on, on investment. Yeah. If you're not adjusting, then... Yes. Yes, absolutely. I won't ask the last question. I won't. I'll ask yes. it later. Yeah, yeah, that's a very later. good point. Yeah. I agree. Right, sorry about that. We've already started interacting with the audience. I'm not, no, no, that's fine, that's fine. Innovation is what this is all about. <laughs> <laughs> we, we now want to hand it back to, you, to the tables again. We've talked a lot about um, the tools and methodology, but in particular the principles and framework. What we're going to do now is to hand them out to you uh, for, for a couple of good reasons. One is, having heard what you've heard about the issue, or even just relating it to the case study, would the tools of the framework and methodology actually help companies get to some of the answers that we've had both from the floor and, and prior to, to, to the conference? They're just being handed out uh, now. But um, you're going to have to visualize them because we're, we're now just going to explain what actually is, is behind them. So, Charles, if you can explain, there are two documents, you'll see them. There's a front piece, and at the back, you'll see something for those who are uh, challenged. That's where I wear my glasses. It's something with very small print. That is the framework. And then in front of that is something which is called the five principles of a purpose driven business and they work together. So I'm just going to ask Charles to explain very quickly what is behind the framework, and I'll quickly explain what's behind the principles. So uh, the framework, which, which says when you get the bit of paper, it says the framework to guide decision-taking, is the document that we spent nine months working on. Uh, it's a long time to produce one side of A4. <laughs> but, uh, and Lachlan did an incredible amount of work with a wonderful person called Sister Helen Alford, who teaches uh, Catholic social teaching at the Angelicum in Rome, and a small group of others. What it, what it has on it is two things. So the first thing is two criteria at the top of the page around purpose. And one of them is about human dignity, and the other is about the common good. So the paragraphs that are there seek to help propose criteria for businesses that are thinking of 
looking again at why they're there. Um, and it's not, it doesn't give you the answer, but it gives you two really probing questions to ask yourself as a business leader when you're thinking about why your business exists. The rest of the page below that are five columns which describe what we call the character, the behaviours needed to develop character. And those, if you think of the model I explained earlier, you have purpose and then there is competence and character. So what is character? What do we mean by character? And those five columns describe that in terms of both the minimum that's required and also what we might expect as people go beyond the minimum. Underlying this is obviously Catholic social teaching and other derivations as well, but the core to this is, which is common to Catholic social teaching, virtue ethics, the Jewish tradition, and many other faiths and none as well, is a distinct anthropology. I wasn't here for, I'm afraid we arrived slightly late this morning for, for the very first uh, session, but I gather that the word anthropology came up there too. But Because I think that, that, that this is, so that there's, a, there's a belief here about the hardwiring of what it is to be human. That yes, of course we're self-interested. At one level, we, we are all contractual, everything is in that sense. That's an important part of what it is to be human. We have needs. But above that, there is a level at which we are all intrinsically relational. And we are all seeking relationships and we're seeking meaning. And that common goods arise through the commitments and relationships that people make. Common goods don't exist automatically. They come into being as a result of the commitments that we make, the family, communities, and indeed businesses. They're a result of human decisions and commitments. And, and this, of course, is at the core of Catholic social thought, and it's at the core of, uh, of, of Aristotelian ethics as well, in terms of understanding what good cities and good societies look like. But this is a, an extraordinary... When you say this in meetings, people say, oh, yeah, I never thought that. <laughs> but it, in one sense, it's obvious. In another sense, it's very profound, and it's something that we've forgotten. We tend to think so much that people are individual. But at the heart of this is the idea that we are also deeply relational and that this gives voice and expression to what that means in a business context. OK, and that, that is the paper that Paul Pullman looked at and said, I like this, I can see what it's trying to do, but I'm not sure everyone will. Would you work with Unilever and other big businesses to provide something that's more accessible, which is the five principles of purpose-driven business? And the task that we had was to make sure we created more accessibility without diminishing the value that we had from the framework. And what you'll see in the design of the five principles is, if you think about it in this way, at the center, you have two important constructs. One is purpose, and the other one is being open to scrutiny and dialogue. So it's not about assertion, it's about dialogue between your views and the views of others. So at the center is purpose and dialogue, and surrounding it are the key relationships that a business needs to enable and nurture to actually prosper for a sustainable future for all. And they are built around employees, customers and suppliers, being a good citizen in the communities in which you operate, and looking to the future in your time frame. And what we've tried to do, and we hope we've managed, is to have much more accessible language. But what we find is once you get into that, there's, there's some words like fair and good, and then you have to go back to the framework to actually deepen your understanding to get to the right answer, particularly around purpose. So that's how they work together. So, so your table exercise, if you're prepared to accept it, is to work together to, to look at these and just, you can think about in the case of the, either the case study or businesses that you are working on or working with, and consider to yourself, would these enable you to help those companies start a journey that would actually end up with a better position for them and society? Also tell us what you think is missing. And if you had any time, but I don't think you will, you might use that to actually derive a new purpose for the pharmaceutical company that you studied earlier. So if you concentrate on the first two, is thinking about a business or the case study, would these tools help us? And what is missing? What more do I need to know? And also then just think about um, how you could actually help derive a purpose. I'll give you 15 minutes and then we'll all get back together again. So have fun. Okay. Okay. I, I want to make sure you don't get hungry today. Ding dong. Ding dong. Hi. I just want to um, get the balance between group discussion, which is healthy, and feeding you, which could make you unhealthy. So I do want to finish, finish on time. 
Uh, I want Naftali to um, answer one question. Now he's back in the room about some of the risks of unpacking this, and it needs to be short, Naftali. Just one thing I'll share as I've been going around the tables is, um, as a communicator, I can be very confusing at times, so I apologize for that. What we were looking at, and some, some tables have, have, have gone in this direction, which is great, is if you were thinking of a company making a change, they wanted to make a change, would these tools actually help them start the journey? Because that's what they're designed to do. <coughs> now, what I'm not going to do is get feedback in the room. Um, we'll be here for the next couple of days so we can, we can discuss it in, in detail. So bring those <coughs> thoughts either to us or keep, keep it as a conversation. In practice, what we found is that the companies who want to start, who are deeply embedded, will go straight to the framework and say, this is deep, it's about who I should be, and if I am the right person, it can be who the company should be. So they go very deep, and when they're trying to get their purpose, they use the framework to do it. Those who are more nervous will go to the framework and just check to see, are they doing some of these things? If they are, <coughs> they feel more confident they can start the journey. And that's the, that tends how they interact. So if I'm slightly nervous, I go to the principles, and then I go to the framework. If I am absolutely clear, this is the right way to go. And it's a level of courage, commitment, and how far you've gone. They will go to the framework, because what the framework does is actually give you a clue about how you should operate, not just as a business, but as a leader and a person in society, because it talks about your personal purpose and character. So that's the way people use them in different ways. <coughs> now, I want, I want to leave it one sort of, and you may think it's a negative point, but I think it's a real... Uh, necessary. I just want to ask Naftali, if we're talking about all this personal and corporate and change, are there any actually risks of doing this? Okay, so um, I, I would identify um, <coughs> at least three risks. Um, the first is uh, that it's going to be painful um, at first. It's, it's a painful process to take yourself apart, to take your company apart. Juan Pablo spoke this morning uh, precisely about that, that journey. So it's painful, uh, but it's necessary, like any healing process is necessary. And, and, and to counteract that risk or to deal with it is to stay with it because it gets easier and, um, and better. Uh, the second is that no matter how well-intentioned you are, you're going to fall short at times. You're not always going to get it right, especially if you're a large, complex organization with outsourced supply chains. Someone along the way is going to let you down and some kid on Twitter is going to make uh, a, a meal out of it. And, and the, the, the risk is once you pick your head up above the parapet and you say, we are doing things better or differently or more ethical, you become a target. Um, and, and, and you need to resist, I would, I would plead with you to resist the easy option, which is just to keep your head below, below the parapet because you can't really make change. Courage. Have the courage, exactly, which is precisely what, what, this, what this whole uh, summit is about. So, so really realize that it's going to be painful, realize that you're going to be attacked at times, and stay the course, because in the long run, you'll do far more good for your organization and for society than you will if you sit by the sidelines. And finally, the third risk, and this has come up in a number of, of ways in the previous conversation, <clears throat> is the disconnect between your purpose and your people. Um, and that is, if you are articulating, <clears throat> excuse me, a vertical top-down model where you're saying, <clears throat> sorry, this is our purpose. This is what we believe. Now buy into it. Uh, what's going to happen often is, is you, you lose your employees on the ground. And the challenge, not so much a risk, but more of a challenge, is how do you get them to buy in as well? And if I could just very briefly bring in my own foundation's work here, Spiritual Capital Foundation, we've devised a methodology and a software around um, creating, um, sort of tempering the vertical with a horizontal. And the horizontal is a platform that allows and encourages every member in the organization to dialogue with the purpose, um, to engage with the purpose, and using not just language, but using various forms of media like art and music um, and, and, and other four as well. Uh, I'm not going to belabor the point, but if any that intrigues any of you, I'm here for two days, and I'd love to talk to you in more detail about that. OK. Thank you, Naftali. Thank, thank you, Charles. Most importantly, thank all of you for your, your effort, challenge, and questions. And we'd be delighted to be with you uh, over the next day or so and answer any more we can.
Thank you very much. Enjoy lunch. <laughs>